Phoenix is the is the weapon system, is the missile that really gives the F-14 what's called a fleet defense capability. Fleet defense capability. Capability of the carrier to defend itself. Hey everybody, it's Plasma1945 coming to you from a cockpit of an F-14 because it's been a month, depending on when you're watching this video, since the Tomcat and the AIM-54 has been downgraded, nerfed, fixed, corrected, or broken depending on who you talk to in the DCS community. This video is going to be a historical snapshot and comparison of the F-14 versus what we find DCS and it's all about where is its future in DCS. If you like this video, make sure you comment and subscribe. If you don't like this video, tell me why in the comments below. I'm going to reference a whole bunch of awesome content from a number of documentaries as well as the Tomcast podcast. Link is in the description. So make sure you subscribe to the Tomcast and the Fighter Pilot podcasts. They're great. But now let's rewind and find out why the Tomcat had to be created. By the mid 1950s, the principal threat to American carrier forces still came from the air. The bear was not fast compared to fighters of the time, but could carry supersonic anti ship missiles, which could be launched with devastating effect. We have to be able to stand off and shoot at those guys. We have to be able to get in and protect that strike group. Against this combination of long range and advanced missile technology, the U.S. Navy had to completely rethink the role of its fighter aircraft. So as you can tell from that, the story that we saw in Top Gun only showed half of the story behind the Tomcat. Yes, it could meet the MiG-28s, aka the F-5s, over the Indian Ocean, but keep in mind that it was only half of its role to do that. The main reason for the Tomcat to be in service and in the air is to be a superb long-range interceptor for the Cold War threats to the US aircraft carriers, and those threats were the Soviet, Russian Tu-95s, Tu-22 bombers carrying cruise missiles. Why was that a threat? Because by itself, the carrier group, the boat, is a pretty big target. Now, not to disregard the Aegis destroyers that are protecting the aircraft carrier group, you still want to be able to move away from what you're protecting towards the enemy and launch those missiles at a standoff distance. Now, if any of those uh, Tu-95s or their cruise missiles get through the first outer layer of the Tomcats with the Phoenixes, then the Aegis destroyers will jump in and do their job. But if you can take some of them out before they get it within even firing range, you will already that much further ahead. Now, what happens if those bombers get through or if no one even scrambles to get them? Well, you're in for a really bad day because you're gonna get swarmed by missiles and only so many of them can be stopped. So the preferred approach to not having this happen to your aircraft carrier is to get your Tomcat in the air and fire those standoff missiles at 60, 70 miles and drive away those bombers. Yes, in the movie it was a sneak attack, but the goal is to have the Tu-22 go down before he gets anywhere close within launch range of his missiles. All right, let's jump over to Wahoo on the Tomcast podcast and listen in on what the Og9 and the Phoenix could actually do. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Link is in the description. The Og9 was designed for the, the Soviet uh, Union at that time before, you know, it was called. And they had Bear and Badger and, and Bison and Cub bombers, you know. And so really it was designed to go against them which aren't aggressive maneuvering targets. You know, if you look at how airplanes were designed, you know, it was, you know, both sides, both us and the Russians, they designed it for the threat. And the F-14 was designed for the Soviet bomber threat. And the AUG-9 was designed to tackle that big threat. And so that's why it was designed to tackle 24 targets at one time and launch six AIM-54, you know, and track those, but really more at a non-maneuvering 
type of target, you know, maybe coming in at higher speed. Uh, but that was the capability. You know, if you had aggressive fighters out there, it was a different problem. And props to Heat Blur for actually simulating the AUG-9 getting overwhelmed by having more than 24 targets in the air. Go to Growling Sidewinder and you'll see that behavior. So we do have that level of realism. Let's check in on the accuracy of that radar. Up to six Phoenix can be fired at six different targets at the same time. Up to 24 targets can be tracked simultaneously. As good as it got. And it could track 24 targets. It just wasn't, you just, it just had some limitations. Well, and the 24 targets were non maneuvering targets. You know, we'll have to yeah. throw that in there too. Because if you had fighter maneuvering, 24 fighter maneuvering targets, it probably couldn't handle it. Scoring an unprecedented 85% success rate. So here's our level of accuracy in the simulation that is DCS World. My AIM-54 here goes stupid as the AI pilot manages to notch my Phoenix. That could be done and there's my success rate from the four bombers that flew against me. I only got 75% of them. Now the Tomcat is designed to go against faster and more maneuverable targets and per my discussion with actual F-14 involved people, I'll leave it at that, the Tomcat was not just a standoff platform, but a fantastic fighter. And we've seen that time and time again in DCS. Some of the best pilots that I've fought against in the sim world were flying Tomcats, getting on my six o'clock, using all of the capabilities of the Tomcat to stay slow, to get the nose authority and to kick my butt. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do one more pass on the carrier and I'm gonna go and shoot down some backfire bombers. Why? Well, because I'm not the only one who can simulate it. I did it in DCS, but let's go back to the actual pilots and listen in for a second. Uh, we used to simulate uh, very realistic scenarios. Uh, for example, backfire bomber flying at 50 to 55,000 feet at supersonic air speeds uh, with lower fighter cover. It takes a big airplane. It takes a big missile. It takes a lot of range. It takes these things in order to handle the problem. We went out on exercise after exercise like this with the F-14 and demonstrated time and again, we can shoot those bombers at long range, still have the short range weapons to get in and visually engage the fighters, take care of them and press on about our business. So inspired by those words, I'm in my Tomcat heading towards five T-22 M3 backfire bombers and I've got some Phoenixes for them. Gonna launch them just off of uh, 65 nautical miles as we're closing at each other at about a rate of 1500 knots. The first three missiles are out at that range and then I'm letting the radar settle for about 45 seconds before I fire the next salvo. So at that point, we are 80 kilometers away, so that's about 40 miles. And here's some additional missiles just as the enemy aircraft four and five cross into the maw. Hits on targets. First two are hit. Here's a third one. Smack. That guy is gone. And what's going to happen to the fourth and the fifth? Well, the fourth T-22 decides to get maneuvering on me, but the Phoenix is tracking him and he has no chance of escaping. Smack and he's gone. The last guy, Chaff, supersonic. This is a tactical supersonic bomber. He does get away. There's our 85% success rate, just as it's supposed to be. What do we do when we get up close? Well, we switch to the other variety of weapons that we've got. Let's do a quick listen in again on the pilots and the documentaries. It carried an M61 cannon for close encounters and dogfighting. The traditional short and medium range Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles. And the long range, deadly accurate Phoenix. The F-14 carries the Phoenix missile as one of uh, three missiles that it can carry. It carries the, uh, the Phoenix, the uh, Sparrow missile, the Sidewinder missile, and then it has a, an internal gun, as a Gatling, Gatling gun cannon that the F-14 carries. So it has a very wide range of missiles. That the nice part about the F-14 is that you got the best of both worlds. You can get into the dogfight role without taking one iota away from the very significant capabilities in the long-range interceptor role. And there you have it. Once again, we're talking about the Tomcat being a multi-purpose, multi-platform aircraft. 
just like the F-15 later became the F-15E with its strike capability, the F-14 already had it from the get-go. It was designed not just to be a dogfighter, but also to be a long-range, AWACS-style, self-GCIing missile platform. And in this case, there you go, the Sidewinders at that Tu-22 that got past my Phoenix. Hey, the Phoenixes are not infallible, but if needed, the Tomcat can switch to its closer range weapons, whether these are AIM-7s or AIM-9s. And in this case, the AIM-9s finish off the last Tu-22 for a success rate of 100% of hostiles destroyed. And now I can RTB. So then comes the question, where does the Tomcat now stand? The Tomcat performs exactly as it should with its AIM-54 missile in the single player world. But for the multiplayer world, is that enough and can it be used? So far I'm seeing more and more JF-17s with their SD-10s taking the Tomcat's place. Where do you think the Tomcat should be? Should we ask Hitler for a missile just for PvP, just for the Tomcat? Comments below and I'll see you guys in the air. Let's listen to Wahoo as he actually talks about the capabilities of the missile on the Tomcast podcast. <laughs> 